John's Gospel spends a lot of time zoomed in on just one night. Since chapter 13, we followed the details of the night before Jesus' death, the night of the Passover meal. The festival is in full swing. Hundreds of thousands of Jews have gathered to remember. Lamb's blood flows down like a river from the Temple Mount in remembrance of the angel of death who passed over their homes all those years ago. God's response to their act of faith in the form of lamb's blood painted across the doors in Egypt. Giant torches were, are lit on the night of Passover and the night before in the temple courts in remembrance of God leading them with pillars of fire in the desert. Psalms and hymns are sung of the gods who parted the sea and led them through to the deserts. And finally, 40 years later, to a land full of milk and honey, of olive trees and fruitful vines. A land with echoes of the garden at the beginning of what life should be. Where humanity walks with God and his peace and his joy and his love. Passover, however, was about much more than the liberation of one enslaved people group and the produce of their new land. It was about a life liberated from sin and reconciled to the presence of the Lord. That's what Passover is really all about. The imagery of the Passover story explains the world's greatest problem and the world's greatest need. The greatest problem is enslavement to sin. The need, union with God. It tells of a desperate world far from God and oppressed by its own in and God's loving desire for reconciliation. God sees the world in its sin, all its brokenness, all its self-harm, all of its horrendous, disgusting, hurtful, broken sin. And he looks and he says, I want them. I want reconciliation. I want to be with them for eternity. It's on this night with the Passover in full swing that Jesus leads his disciples from the, the place that the Passover meal was eaten down the steps of the city wall into the Kidron Valley across this what would have been a very dry place at that time of the year that the river would not have been running it, it's only in flood season that it does it would have been dry as a bone and then they go up to the other side of the valley to the Mount of Olives to a walled garden to Gethsemane and it was there at a garden Jesus chooses to be the place of his arrest the place he wants for the drama of his betrayal to play out where he's going to be betray betrayed for our forgiveness at the cross that's where we're going why there he could have just stayed where he was and surely Judas would have led them to the upper room it seems to me that there are at least two reasons the first is this this is a place that King David Jesus' great, 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 great grandfather was also betrayed. That's about a thousand years before Jesus turns up. Now you might be thinking, what on earth has that got to do with anything? Well, David was God's chosen king at the time, but his son Absalom betrays him. He raises up an army, priests, and counsellors to turn against David. 
And when David gets word about the betrayal, he heads out of Jerusalem, across the Kidron Valley, and up to the Mount of Olives. Sounds familiar. It's recorded in 2 Samuel 15, verse 23 tells us, The whole countryside wept aloud as all the people passed by. The king also crossed the Kidron Valley, and all the people moved on toward the wilderness. Then David, verse 30, continued up the Mount of Olives, weeping as he went. The weeping king had the Ark of the Covenant with him, which contained God's law. It carried the presence of God. But David said to Zadok, one of the priests, take the Ark of God back into the city. If I find favour in the Lord's eyes, if I find favour, he will bring me back and let me see it and his dwelling place again. But if he says, I am not pleased with you, then I am ready. Let him do to me whatever seems good to him. Now here, in John 18, we have the King of Kings in the garden. And Matthew's Gospel tells us that Jesus prayed, My Father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. Like David, Jesus trusts God to establish his kingdom and bring him home to glory. Jesus is deliberately echoing that story. Why? You might say, well, I see the similarities, Ian, okay, but why does it help us understand what Jesus is doing here? Remember, God said to David that he would raise up a king from his family line to succeed him and that he would establish the throne of his kingdom forever. He said of David's, uh, he said of David's descendant, I will be his father and he will be my son. Jesus' actions here on the night of his betrayal tell us that he is the son of David. He's the stump of Jesse. He's the king of kings. He is the son of God, betrayed like David, who takes an exilic type walk out of Jerusalem, a Passover like journey across the Kidron and towards the fruitful garden where he weeps as David did on the Mount of Olives. That's the first reason he chooses the garden. He's the king. I think the second reason that Jesus wants his betrayal to play out in the garden is that he has come to reverse the world's greatest betrayal that also took place in a garden. It takes us back to the story at the very beginning. Adam, meaning mankind, walked with God in the garden. Eve, meaning womankind, walked with God in the garden. Eden was the world's first temple. In Genesis 1 and 2, they were given this call, this mission, to fill the earth with fruitfulness and with the life of God, to be a people who advance into the world, building uh, this image-bearing, worshipful, purposeful, loving community. Communities. But there instead... We know the story. The enemy slithered in. And he starts to lie about God's intentions. Don't you think God is holding something back from you? See how he twists it? Wouldn't it be better if, you know, you knew what he knows? Wouldn't it be better to be in charge of your own destiny. Even though Adam and Eve walked in the presence of God, they still betrayed betrayed him. Now Judas, who has literally walked side by side with the Son of God for three years, has returned to the garden they often went to together, a place that I can imagine Jesus using. Plants and vines and trees as object lessons as he teaches them about the kingdom of God. Teeming with life all around him, 
he speaks about the life that you can have in God. Yet Judas does what Adam did. He comes to the garden even though he walked with him there to betray God. Judas has seen the healings, he's seen demons cast out, heard the dumbfounding wisdom of Jesus' teaching. And Jesus has loved him without a a hint of rejection or self-protection. Judas had his feet washed by Jesus that night like he was his Gentile slave. Judas has no reason, no good reason, to betray Jesus. But he does. He had slithered out into the darkness and returned with slippery friends. Religious elites on one side, at least 200 Roman soldiers on the other, with torches burning brightly, looking with great irony for the Son of God, for the King of Kings, for the light of the world, for the betrayed one of the garden. John says, Judas went into the night back in chapter 13. Now he returns in darkness with the false flames of religion and power to arrest his Lord. In this story, we are not more like Jesus, we are more like Judas. We are more like him than we would like to think. Think about it. No one really wants to deny themselves. No one really wants to bow down their stubborn wills to God. We were all born in Adam. All of us have betrayed our maker. We have chosen to go our own way at all costs. Like Adam and Judas, we have joined forces with man-made religion and the powers of the world to rebel against God. Jesus' response? To be betrayed, arrested, and hung on a cross for you. You have betrayed God but he is willing to be betrayed for you so that you can belong with him. Some people in this room have been horribly betrayed by people. In marriage, by other family members, in business. But all of us are part of this greater betrayal. My own story with Lindsay is actually a bit of a picture of what we've all done. We were dating for four years. We had talked about getting married. We'd gone ring shopping. And I have a freak out. Is this what I'm supposed to feel? Should I be on cloud nine all the time? Like, is this right? Is she the one? Ah. I freaked out, even though I'd said the very powerful words, I love you. Even though I'd said, I want to spend the rest of my life with you. And I walked away. It took me a full year to work out I'd made a dreadful mistake. I mean, I was just living out my generation's sin. Dreaming of a a life that was more constructed by friends than it was the Bible. By God's grace, she had the strength and love to take me back. And we, in some ways, have done something so similar. We have walked away from the one who loves us. We have done our own thing, even though we were made for him. 
Jesus betrayed like David in Jerusalem and God in the garden. Is the Son of God come to reverse the betrayal of the world? To take our betrayal all the way to the cross so we can find forgiveness in him. And he was also willing to be banished. Jesus has his eyes open. John says that although he knows everything that will happen to him, he goes out to them and asks, who is it that you want? He does not hide in a dark corner of the garden. He doesn't jump over a wall. He doesn't do a guardy run, if you know what that is, and disappear into the distance. Does nobody know what a guardy run is? There's a few people shaking their heads. You've not lived. <laughs> we used to do guardy runs all the time. Matthew knows what a guardy run is. You start at one end of the street and you have to make it to the other end of the street by just jumping hedges and walls. It's a great thing to do when you're 12. Um, possibly not something I would advise you to do, but great fun. I digress. He doesn't do a guardy run. He doesn't run. He doesn't try and hide somewhere. He does not ask the disciples to come up with a cover story. He comes out to the garden to meet them. Jesus steps out of the life-giving garden to meet Judas. In the same way that he stepped out of heaven to meet you. There you were, determined to do things your own way, flanked by self-made effort and partners in the world, going against God instead of going with him. But Jesus came out of heaven, this life-giving, abundant place, and he came into the wilderness of the world to have an encounter with you out of his great love. The word in the beginning became flesh and true light shone on you. Jesus has come down to meet with us on the road of destruction and to reveal the grace and power of our God to show you the way, Jesus. He's the way. And in Jesus you see God. He has come to reveal him to you and give you salvation. Who is it that you are looking for? Jesus says. Jesus of Nazareth, they reply. They might as well spit on the ground at the same time. It's a nothing place, the butt of jokes, and certainly not the place a king would come from. What good comes out of Nazareth? Their attitude changed with just two words. I say two words, even though your version probably has three words. Your version probably says, I am he. But if you've been with us through the book of John, it will not surprise you that the Greek doesn't record Jesus' reply with three words, but only two. He really says, I am. The same way God revealed himself to Moses at the burning bush, he reveals himself here as I am. I am who I am. And the name Jesus has been using to reveal himself, and we've been tracking all the way through John, right? I am statements. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the door. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And I am the true vine. God has come out of the garden, and Judas, along with 200 plus soldiers and the religious elites, see something of God's glory through those two words. With those two words, the bravado and the arrogance of these men is destroyed in a moment, verse 6. They draw back and they fall face down before Jesus, face down before God. A natural response we see again and again and again in Scripture when people are given a glimpse of the glory of God. God said that through the prophet Isaiah, I, even I, am the Lord, and apart from me, there is no saviour. There is no salvation for us if Jesus is not fully God. He had to be our representative. Fully man, yes, 
So obviously an everyday person could be wrapped up in the prejudices, prejudices towards someone from Nazareth. So on the one hand, this man from Nazareth, on the other, when the revelation comes, face down. Only God could show us the glory of God we are made for. But only a sinless person could represent us before him. Praise him. The only qualified one did not shrink back. We said, if it is your will, Lord, I will do it. And he steps out of the garden, he confronts them, and he reveals himself to them. He is very deliberately going to the cross for you. That's what he's doing. He is not just a victim in that sense. He is orchestrating this whole thing. Only God could reveal God. And he comes out from behind those walls and he is not only self-banishing himself. That doesn't sound quite right, but you know what I mean. But he is saying, I am willing to be crucified outside of the holy city, outside of Jerusalem, at Golgotha. The place where sinners go to die. Vanished so we could belong. Jesus could surely have walked away at this point. I mean, they are trembling before him. But he says again, who is it you want? I wonder what the response was like this time. Probably not quite so confident. Uh, Jesus of Nazareth? Do you remember what Jesus said in chapter 10? In one of his I am statements, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father and I lay down my life for the sheep. He goes on. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. This is what Jesus chooses to do for us. We have tried to find ourselves away from God and his presence. We've tried to gain life for ourselves, but in him, <laughs> we have found that there is true life. We were once banished with Adam with no way back. But he comes out to us and says, stop trying to earn this thing. I'm going to do it for you. We cannot fight our way into heaven. We cannot work hard enough to earn our entry fee. But here comes Jesus, just as he came from heaven to earth. He comes out from the place of life to go to the place of death. He has come from the eternal belonging of the Godhead. And at that chosen time and place, he has taken our place of banishment outside the garden. He has come out of the garden to give life to the very people who seek his death. Even those who seek his death, he offers life. He has come out of the garden to our place in the wilderness. This is Jesus, self-banished for your belonging at the cross. And not only that, but he is willing to be bound for your freedom. Jesus' demand to let the disciples go in verse eight is more exilic language. It's the, the words of God to Pharaoh in Exodus 5, let my people go. And it's what he came to do for us. Some of us really need to wrap our heads around this. Jesus saw you in eternity past and did not, and, and when I see, say he saw you, he knew everything you would be about.
all the reasons that you think God won't be pleased with you, he saw every single one of them. And he chose then and has resolutely set out from that moment, from eternity past, from the eternal moment, and he has come to rescue you. He set out for the cross knowing you would be exactly who you are today. He has come to rescue you. He did not see you and think, oh, yuck, or hold his nose and reluctantly do what he had to do. He saw you in your sin and muck and was moved with compassion and love. He saw you far away from him and wanted you near for all eternity. God saw you and made a deliberate, all-knowing plan to come out of the glory of heaven to be betrayed, banished, bound and killed on a Roman cross. For you. He intentionally set out with you in mind to take your place. Let my people go. The God of the garden has set out to be bound by the people he has come to set free. He's, will, he's willingly saying, look, bind me up. Take me to the cross so that the people I love will be free. In the same breath, Jesus can confidently say, I have not lost one of them. And that is true of anyone who truly believes. He is never letting you go. Your freedom is bound up in his. We sang earlier about being bound to Christ. You have been bound to him, died with him, been resurrected with him, and you will have eternal life with him. Peter's response is possibly surprising. I'm not sure it is. I think that would be quite a natural response. Maybe that says something about me. They are arresting my teacher, my Lord. We can't have this. How dare they? I must defend him and his honor. This is the time to respond to the nonsense of the world. It's time to stand up and be counted. It's time to fight. Ah! In the spiritual realm, a sword does nothing. Even a nuclear bomb has no real power. That is how the enemy can be defeated. Not by might or by power. The rah-rah-rah of misplaced Christian enthusiasm is blah, blah, blah to the enemy. I once went to a Christian festival where one of the speakers got a little carried away. And uh, he said, I want a generation to stand. And he gets very passionate. And he starts telling these hundreds of young people, you are going to change the world. And it gets louder and louder and louder. You're going you're to do amazing things for Jesus. You're going to do amazing things for the kingdom. You're going to do this and you're going to do that. And you're going to do... Wah! I think he'd forgotten we're in Scotland, so... When he looked for a response, a few people went, yeah. <laughs> that, kind of, that kind of thing, we need to be so careful with. We don't want to deny the prophetic. If God is doing something and he's on the move, we want to get involved in that. And we want to believe God for what he can do. Not look around and just think that it's about us and our power. It's not. It's about his power and strength. But it comes through self-sacrifice. It comes through the way of the cross. It comes by us laying our lives down, not finding some ambition that we can fulfill in the kingdom of God. Jesus is not interested in your ambition in the kingdom of God. Be ambitious, be ambitious for Jesus. Be ambitious for the throne of heaven. Be ambitious for the glory of God. Don't be ambitious for your little corner of power. Who cares? It's pathetic. 
let's not get involved as much as the world is teaching us again and again and again to think that we apply every area of life like this to our own self-gain, we must in the church be different and follow the way of Jesus and be deferential towards others, willing to put others first, willing to lay our lives down, willing to say, Jesus, I will follow you and I'm going to follow you in your ways. Put your sword away. The things you often want Jesus to help you with, he wants to save you from. And he calls us to put those things that are about us to death. They are of Adam, they are of Judas, they are of the world, they are of man-made religion. That's what that is. You might not look like the Pharisees, you might not be wearing the regalia, but when it comes about, becomes about you, it's just the same. The heart is the same. Jesus shows us how to fight, and he shows us how the battle is really won, even when it looks like it's lost. Verse 10. Shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? The cup is God's cup of wrath. His righteous judgment. No one can escape it. There is only one who has walked the earth who does not deserve to drink it. Psalm 75 pronounces this judgment over all and points out the foolishness of thinking that somehow we have the wisdom or power to judge the earth ourselves. That sometime, somehow we know better than God. You say, this is what Psalm 75 says, you say, I choose the appointed time. It is I who judge with equity. When the earth and all its people quake, it is I who hold its pillars firm. To, to the arrogant I say, boast no more. To the wicked, do not lift up your horns. Do not lift your horns against heaven. Do not speak so defiantly. No one from the east or the west or from the desert can exalt themselves. It is God who judges. He brings one down. He exalts another. In the hand of the Lord is a cup full of foaming wine mixed with spices. He pours it out and all the wicked of the earth drink it down to its very dregs. As Jesus is bound, he says, I'm coming to drink that cup. And when we are confronted by this cup that he is willing to drink, we are confronted by our own sin. Don't let these words wash over you. Jesus, knowing the weight of God's holy judgment, was coming against him. He chooses to say, I must drink that cup. You see, we're not only distant and far off from God, we're not only rebellious, but we are under his judgment. Because this place cannot be holy, it cannot be everything that it was made to be. We cannot walk in the life of the garden again unless it is made holy, unless we are made holy. Unless we become like temples. Jesus the only one who is judge of all and the only one who can stand before God's law and not be condemned but justified steps forward. Look closely. Jesus has been so overwhelmed by sorrow that he cried out to his Father for any possible alternative. Now, seeing that it is the Father's will and the only possible way for us to be saved, he takes hold of the cup of wrath. At the beginning of the passage, Jesus left the room where he had offered the disciples another cup. Jesus led the disciples across the Kidron Valley through that dry valley of betrayal and he has the disciples <laughs> drink before he leaves that place and goes across to the garden and then comes out and says he's going to take this other cup of wrath. He has them drink it and he says, drink, this is the blood of my covenant, do this in remembrance of me. Now he takes hold of this other cup, this cup we should drink. 
the cup of wrath. That's the cup that's been reserved for us. That's the cup that should have our name on it. That's the cup that we deserve. But Jesus says, even so, I am going to drink this cup and give you another cup. I'm going to give you the cup of grace. And I will drink the cup of wrath. I am going to give you the cup of communion that says, all my sin and my shame have been taken from me because Jesus was willing to drink the cup of wrath. Every time we get together, we take communion and we can remember that Jesus was willing to take another cup so we can drink that cup. The cup of forgiveness, the cup of joy, the cup of grace, the cup of hope, the cup of Christ. There is no one like them, him. There is no one that compares to him. There is no one else that could have drank that cup. And it is the only way that we can drink, drink that cup and we will drink that cup into the wedding feast of the Lamb and we will know him forever and enjoy his presence and be with him and worship him and be everything that we were made to be finally at last in the holy and holy, holy, holy place with Jesus himself. That's what we're made for. That's what I want for you. That's why we're doing this. If we want something else, if we want personal ambition, chuck us out. Get rid of us. If we want Jesus for you, then let's keep going together and following him with all our hearts. And this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he has loved us and sent his son as a propitiation for our sin. That means he's absorbed and taken away the sin that was on us and the wrath of God that we deserved so that we could drink the cup of grace. He comes out of the garden to be bound for your freedom, freedom from sin and all its consequences. And here in the night of Passover with lamb's blood, remember, pouring down from the temple mount is the lamb of God come to take away your sin. Bound for your freedom. No matter how dark our lives get, we will experience suffering, but not like this. When we are wronged and in pain, when death looms or grief comes, we can remember that Jesus suffered and was tempted in every way and now comforts us in our time of need and can give us great confidence of our hope that means that we will endure and be with him forever. There will be an end to your suffering because of his suffering. There will be an end to your pain because he was willing to be inflicted. He was willing to take the pain of the world upon himself. Jesus is our suffering servant and he offers us mercy and grace. He is able to comfort you like no one else as a result. This is Jesus bound for your freedom, which is one at the cross. Caiaphas intended for Jesus to be killed to get rid of the big problem. Kill one man, problem goes away. What he didn't realize was that actually by killing this one man, we could all be set free. Jesus, betrayed for your forgiveness at the cross, banished for your reconciliation at the cross, bound for your freedom at the cross. I'm going to pray for us and then we're going to take communion together and I simply want us to remember I deserved the cup of wrath but because of Jesus I drink the cup of grace, the communion cup. So during our worship time together can I just encourage you come down, take a piece of bread, take the cup, take it back and can you, can you just get on your knees or do what you need to do? Just get before Jesus. 
ask for his forgiveness, know that he has won it for you, and enter into his presence, remembering that it is not about your performance, it's not about how you think you look or how you feel, it is simply about what Jesus has done for you. Come to the God of grace. He loves you.